going to pray before we begin, but I know this, for as many of us as this is a day of celebration and a day of, of like, the man, I love being a mom, I know that there's a lot of people that this is also a day uh, of remembering, uh, of grief, of loss, of maybe even a dream that hasn't been met yet. And so I never want to just start right into this sermon without just praying God's touch over you, uh, because I know for some of us, this is a difficult day. So thank you for putting yourself out there and being here this morning. If today is hard for you, I just want to say thank you for, for making the effort to be here in the house house of God today. Can we do that? Let's pray this morning. Lord, I know that God for today, uh, today for some of us, Lord, it's a day of celebrating and remembering all the blessings in our lives. And for some of us, we remember the blessings, but it's also a day of remembering a painful situation or a loss. And so Lord, this morning, I pray for those that are grieving and those that are hurting, those that are um, waiting in a season of waiting. I pray that you would be with them today, that they would know your presence in a very real, in a very tangible way in this place. I pray um, that God today would be a reminder of the Father's love, which has been um, just handed down to us in the most amazing ways. I pray for a blessing and a, Lord, just a, a touch over every mom in this room, every, every grandmother, every great grandmother in the place, um, that God, they would just feel your presence, they would feel um, loved and special and valuable this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I did want to um, uh, let you know, in case you didn't see it when you came in, there's a table in the lobby right out on this side that has these little candles. They are specially made just for our church, and they smell amazing. Your entire home will smell like whatever the scent is. So, ladies, this is not just for moms. If you are a lady, if you are a teenage girl, if you're a mama, a grandma, it doesn't matter. They're for you, okay? So as you exit today, make sure you grab one of those candles. You will not regret it. I had one in my office and the entire office suite smelled like that candle the other day. It was amazing. So, um, all right, so I'm going to get right in here this morning uh, and share with you, but I just realized you might not know who I am. I am Sherry. I am Pastor Matt's wife. Um, I also work here at the church, and I love what I get to do, but every year on Mother's Day, I get to do kind of a, a special Mother's Day sermon, but this year we thought it'd be really cool if we kept it in keeping with the Dinner with Jesus series. So our sermon today will be one of the Dinner with uh, Jesus sermon series. So just so you know what we're going to be talking about, and you'll get it in just a moment. Okay, so here's a question. How many people in this room have ever helped to plan a wedding? You've been a part of planning a wedding on some level, okay? Maybe you were a bridesmaid, maybe you were the groom, maybe you were the, uh, whatever, whatever it was. Okay, how many of you know that's like a bigger job than you think it's going to be, right? You're like, no big deal, I'll just help out. Yeah, that is, that's like the biggest understatement ever, right? So Matt and I, when we went to get married, um, we were on staff at a pretty large church, so we decided we needed to invite the whole church because, I mean, how do you pick and choose, right? And then I had been a youth sponsor in a very large youth group before that, so I thought, well, I can't pick and choose teens, so I invited my whole youth group. Then we invited both sides of our family, which if anybody knows the Harris side, there is a few Harrises running around town here. There's a lot of Harris people, okay? And so we invite his family, my family, all the church people. The problem was... We had no clue how many people were gonna show up. So planning for food and seating and drinks was like, oh my goodness, we have no idea. So we just kept saying, just go big, just guess big, just go you know, over the top, because the last thing you want is to run out. So we did good on food and drinks and chairs. But partway through our reception, our photographer came up to Matt, I believe, and um, said, hey, there's a problem. I ran out of film on my camera and I can't take any more pictures. So for anybody who's younger than like 30, this was the stuff that used to go inside of cameras. <laughs> and when you would take a picture, yeah, it would like forward to the next part of the film. And so you had to take that out and go get it printed. Anyways, it's a story. You can ask mom and dad later. But um, so literally he ran out of film. We couldn't get pictures. My, my oldest brother came to my wedding and we have no proof of it because the photographer ran out of film at our wedding. So today in the Bible, we're gonna read a story about a wedding crisis, a little blooper that happened at a wedding. But first, I thought it might be fun to check out a few wedding bloopers from YouTube. Okay, check them out. <laughs> He's still stuck. 
<laughs> Did you see the splash? The splash makes it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Uh-oh. I mean, what could possibly go wrong at a wedding, right? Um, so we're going to read a story from the Bible about a wedding and something that went wrong in John chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, you can kind of open up to John chapter 2, and we're going to stay there for most of the sermon. Um, but John chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, it says, On the third day, it was the third day after Jesus' baptism, there was a wedding at, the Can at, sorry, at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to his servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to his servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine, they did not and did not know where it came from, though the servants had drawn the water new. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. So you see this couple, they're getting married. They've invited Mary, the mother of Jesus. They've invited Jesus and his disciples. The wedding's probably going good up until that point. Looks like it, sounds like it. And then something happens. This poor, sweet couple, they didn't plan for enough wine. They didn't have enough. They run out. I don't know about you, but if your wedding planner came up to you in the middle of your reception and said, hey, we're out of food. We don't have anything to drink. What would your response be? Like, dude, go to the store. Find something. Go somewhere, right? Like, go to McDonald's, Taco Bell. I don't care. Just provide food for the people, right? That's probably what their response was. Like, how fast can we come up with a solution? I want to tell you a little bit about the weddings in the Jewish culture back then because it's kind of a cool picture. It's different than today. We think of a couple hours in the afternoon with a couple hours reception, you know, something like that. But for those in the Jewish culture, it was a very long multi-day experience. So all day this first day, they're celebrating, they're feasting, they're eating, they're partying it up. And then as evening comes, the father would take his daughter in his arm and would parade her through the streets in their town, in their village. And as they would go home to home, people would come out of their homes and they would celebrate in the street. They would congratulate them in the street. It was this big feeling of celebratory, like this big celebration. Then they would make it back to the front door of the groom's home. They would stand in the doorway of the groom's home and there would be kind of the wedding ceremony. They would make it official at the doorway of the groom's home. And then we would think, oh, cool, they've already partied. Now they've done the ceremony. Life is good. That was the beginning. So we would take a honeymoon. They didn't take a honeymoon. They had an open house party from then until about a week from then. For the next seven days, it was an open house. How many of you think, oh, my goodness, <laughs> right? Like, no thanks. Seven days. So somewhere in the midst of this wedding party, we don't know exactly when they run out of wine, okay? A little bit different picture than we have at the beginning of that. So they are out of wine. It's like a social nightmare for this to happen in that culture. So what can we learn from this story? Obviously, we know the end of the story is Jesus does this amazing miracle, okay? But what else can we learn from this story? So I've got four points. I'm gonna have you guys help me. So you gotta repeat back to me this morning. The first one is this, take your requests to Jesus. Can you guys say that? Take your requests to Jesus. We see Mary has this amazing example of this. John 2, 3 and 4. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. She realizes the problem. She goes directly to the source. She says they have no wine. And Jesus says to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. You see, the mother of Jesus, she knew, oh, I know who can help you with this wine problem, right? Like, I know my son. I know that he can provide for you. He's lived with me for 30 plus years. I know what he's capable of. Do you love how Jesus responds to his mom? Woman? That's how I took it, at least when I read it. I was like, ooh, my kids better not come home today and be like, woman, 
I need some lunch, <laughs> right? Like, don't be talking to my mama lately. Like, right? But here's the thing is, she didn't respond rude back. So then I was like, what, what in the world? Why is he saying woman that way? Well, I looked it up, and it would be kind of more similar to what we would say, ma'am. So like, ma'am, it's not my time yet. So what's Jesus saying? He's saying like, hey, I came to give my life, right? I came, I'm gonna do all these miracles, but God hasn't released me. It's not time yet for the whole world to see all these miracles. That's what Jesus was saying, ma'am, not woman, right? Like he was saying it that way. But he did kind of tell his mom like, hey, I don't have to do what you're saying right now. I don't have to. But I love that he did anyways. It's kind of an interesting thing. He did end up kind of, I'll say, obeying his, mom, his mom's request. Mary knew a problem that was occurring and she knew exactly where the solution was. Oh, you got a problem, you're out of wine, let's go talk to Jesus. He can help, he can help. Mary couldn't make Jesus do anything though. And I think that even in that proximity, she was the mother of Jesus. Talk about a close relationship. But Jesus, he had to make that decision if it was what he was gonna do in that moment. And I think some of us were like, well, if I'm just close enough to Jesus, I'll convince him. I'll persuade him to do what I want him to do. I'll beg him enough, I'll plead with him enough, I'll, I'll say enough prayers, I'll do it in a holy way, whatever it is, and I'll convince God to do what I want him to do. How many of you know we don't get to convince God to do anything, do we? No, no, we, we can't persuade him, and neither really could Mary. But he does tell us to bring our requests to him. He tells us, hey, if you have a need, bring it to me. And so in Philippians 4, verse 6, it says, don't be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious about what? Don't be anxious about what? But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, no matter what you're going through. We look at this and it's like, it's just wine, okay? Just let them drink water. It's not a big deal. It may have seemed like a small deal, right? Maybe it seemed like a huge deal. Maybe they really liked wine, I don't know. But here's the deal, is like, we may think, well, my request is pretty small. He's saying, no, don't worry about anything, but in everything, present your request to God. There's nothing too small. Bring it to him. Moms, we need to bring our requests to God. When you're walking through stuff with your, with your kids at home, with your husband at home, with your finances at home, dads, grandmas, teens, no matter what you're walking through, he says, bring your requests to him. Bring your requests to him. Is your child struggling with anxiety? Bring it to Jesus. Is, your, is someone in your family sick? Bring it to Jesus. Are your bills bigger than your bank account? Bring it to Jesus. Are your children running away from instead of towards God? Bring it to Jesus. Amen? No matter what your situation, bring it to Jesus. I love that Mary simply took the problem and she took it directly to the provider. She knew, I have a problem, but there's a provider. And I wish I would get that down in life. How many of you have spent way too much time worrying and fretting about things that you should have just taken directly to Jesus? Amen? What if we learn, like Mary, you have a problem, here's Jesus. Bring your request to him. Number two, Cultivate an obedient heart. Will you guys say that with me today? Cultivate an obedient heart. Cultivate an obedient heart. In John 2, 5, it says, but his mother told the servants, do whatever he tells you to do. Just do it. No matter what Jesus is about ready to say, just do it, right? And I love that she said it after he was like, woman, it's not even my time yet. And she's like, yeah, just do whatever he tells you to do, right? She kind of blows off the fact that he said that. And she's like, no, no, go ahead, just do it. Whatever Jesus is about ready to say, you go ahead and do that. Am I ready? Are you ready today to do whatever he tells you to do to see an answer to prayer? To see an answer, to see a solution to the problem that you're facing? Are you willing to say yes if he were to say, okay, now go do this? Are we like, yeah, okay, no matter what that is, I'm gonna say yes. I was talking to um, Carolina, I don't know if she's in here right now, but uh, my assistant, she, she was talking to me about this sermon and the concept was sometimes when we're asking for a financial miracle, it's funny how we're like, oh, I'm in this def, you know, desperate financial crisis. And for whatever reason, when you're in a financial crisis, it's almost like God presents someone else in your life who's in a worse financial crisis situation and they're asking for help. And it's almost like, are you gonna be generous to this other person in your life 
in order to see God's blessing over here. And I told her, I was like, that's crazy. That exact same thing has happened to me so many times. This past week, our AC unit, oh man, we went to El Salvador and I was like, it is the hottest place on planet earth, right? And there was no AC for like seven days straight. And then I got home and I'm like, AC, and then our air conditioning broke and it is still broken. Our house is like 1 million degrees. It's so funny. But in the midst of that and having to be like, oh, we got to replace an AC unit. In the midst of that, I was presented with another person who's in a way worse financial crisis. And the question is, will I be generous, right? Am I gonna say yes and be obedient to God to helping this other person? Or am I gonna hoard all my money that I've got to to pay for my problem, right? Sometimes God asks us to do things that don't make sense. Why would I give my money away right now when I need it for me? Does that make sense? John 2, seven and eight. So Jesus tells his servants, fill the jars with water. That's gonna produce wine, fill jars with water. When the jars have been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of the ceremonies. What did he, what does it say they did? So the servants followed his instructions. They did exactly what he asked. Why would I pour water into a jug and then take it to the master of the ceremonies? It doesn't make sense, but Jesus said so. So let's do it. They needed wine fast. Jesus had a solution, put the water in, fill it to the brim, and now we're taking it. And God does something extraordinary. Mary is there. I wonder if she keeps reminding him, hey guys, just do whatever. I said, whatever, stop arguing. Don't give him a dirty look, right? Just fill the jugs with water, do it. And they did. Sometimes God asks us to do crazy things, to be obedient to him. But it's amazing how he is so much smarter than we are. And he knows exactly why we should do it. James 2.17 says, in the same way, faith by itself if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. So many of us will say, I believe that God could do amazing things. I believe that God is a miracle working God. I believe that God could restore a marriage, but we're not willing to do what he's asking us to do to fix our marriage. I believe God could fix my finances, but I won't change a thing about the way I spend or save or give, right? And we're like, God, why won't you answer my prayers? And he's saying, because You will not obey when I tell you to do something. So it's super important that we obey. A few years ago, Matt and I were really praying for specifically for several of our children, just in the aspect of their spiritual walk with Christ. We were praying, God, would you just do some miracles? Would you give them godly Christian friends? God, would you surround them with people who love you? God, would you help them to not be jaded towards the things of of God and the things of of the church and all that stuff? Like, God, help them to be passionate about you. Let them have this new fire inside of them. And in the middle of that kind of season of praying that for our kids, we felt like God was telling us to pull our kids out of the school they had been presently attending for all of their growing up years that we loved and adored and all of their friends attended and to put them in a different school. And we were like, oh my goodness, that's, that's a hard decision because these are amazing people and we've had an amazing experience. But we felt like it was exactly what God was telling us to do. And so we did it. We did it even though some of our kids did not like this decision. We did it even though it was a, a, a commitment, even though it was change, we obeyed. And I can tell you now, several years later, looking back, it is exactly what God needed to do for our kids' sake. But we had to make an, a, a choice Will I do whatever God's asking me to do to see the answer to the prayer that I'm requesting? Amen? We have to say yes. Um, God's ways are significantly higher than mine. He is so much smarter, and he sees way further down the line than I do for my children, for my family, for my finances. He knows what's coming six months from now, six years from now, 16 years from now, and we don't. So we have to trust. Romans 11, 33 to 34 says, oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. For who can know the Lord's thoughts and who knows enough to give him advice? How many of you in this room have ever tried to give God advice? Anybody? Yeah, yeah, I don't think I'm alone on that. It's like, hey, God, did you know? It's like, what am I talking about? Like, of course he knows all things, right? So it's not up to me to give God advice. He is so much smarter. He's so much, so much smarter than I could ever be. So I've got to trust that he knows best for me and for my family. Amen? Amen. Okay, number three. Everybody say number three. Thank you. Remember that in God's hands, the ordinary becomes extraordinary. In God's hands, the ordinary becomes extraordinary. 
In John 2, 9 and 10, it says, When the master of ceremonies tastes the water that was now wine, not knowing where it came from, though the, the servants knew, of course, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first. Then when everyone has a lot to drink, they bring out the less expensive wine. But you have kept the best until now. How cool is it that God took these jugs of water? They filled them with water. How ordinary is water, right? It's just water. They had these jugs that were used for purification. These Jews, they all knew what they were for. It's just an ordinary jug filled with ordinary water. We use it to purify ourselves so we can go into the temple. That's what these things are. That's pretty ordinary. And then he uses Mary, this ordinary teenage girl who's not married, who's not a mom, who's not a Proverbs 31 woman. She's just a teenage kid to be the mother of Jesus. How interesting that God chooses to use the servants, the ordinary servants at a wedding party to do this miracle through. How cool is that? A jug filled with water, a servant, a mother who's just an ordinary teenager, and he takes it and does something so extravagant, something we can't even imagine. I looked it up. It would have been approximately 180 gallons of wine Okay, if you break that down, it equals 11,520 eight ounce glasses of wine. How many of you think that's more wine than most people have at their weddings? <laughs> 11,000 cups of wine. Okay, that is a lot of wine. I think how cool is it? It's partway through the week, right? Partway through the party. They don't need 11,000 cups of wine. Like the whole town would be stupid drunk, right? Like it's just a, so much wine. So you just look and you think, well, why did God do that? Because he proved how extravagant and amazing and powerful and awesome he was. I can take water from a jug and use a servant to make wine. How many of you think that's an amazing God? He takes the ordinary and makes it extraordinary. He did it through the disciples. He did it through Mary. Mary, in the book of Luke, she writes a song. And here's what she says about herself. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all the generations will call me blessed. She's just like, I'm just like this ordinary, humble servant. And he chose me. And I think that's what he does through us, moms. How many of you just think, I'm, I'm an ordinary person who does laundry and cooks and cleans and shops a lot, right? Most days, right? We're like, I feel like this most ordinary human. How could what I'm doing right now in the ordinary reading a book, changing a diaper, putting a kid to bed, dealing with a sick kid, whatever it is, those feel like such mundane, ordinary things. And God's like, don't worry. I can take the ordinary things you're doing and do something extravagant, something extraordinary through your life. And I've seen it time and time again. Moms, I think we, don't, we underestimate the call of God to do the ordinary in an obedient way and over time to watch as God does something extravagant in our kids' lives, in our kids' future. I think of the impact, not just on my kids today who are 22 and 21 and 19 and 16, but to think two or three or four generations down the line how much eternal impact my life might be able to have if I would just be obedient to the mundane, ordinary things today because in God's hands, that's extravagant and extraordinary. Amen? Okay, in 1 Corinthians 1, 27 to 29, it says, God chose the things that the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and he used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. Then listen to this last phrase, and as a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. I think, Lord, help me to get out of the way. I want to stay ordinary. I want to stay humble. It's not about me. I just want God to be glorified through my life. I want God to do something extraordinary through my life, not because of something grand that I did. I just took steps of obedience, and God began to work and began to move, and he gets all of the glory and all of the honor for everything that he does through my life. So, moms, if you feel like you're just this ordinary person, just continue to take steps of obedience and say, God, would you be glorified through my life? God, would you be exalted through everything I say and everything I do? And he will most definitely do that. All right, number four, when you've run out, Jesus is enough. Would you guys say this phrase with me? 
When you've run out, Jesus is enough. I read a research deal this week by Barna Research and Mops, if you've heard of Mothers of Preschoolers. Um, they did a deal and it said that 32% of moms live most of their life feeling tired. So if you're a mom in here and you say, I'm part of the 32%, raise your hand. I live most of my life feeling tired. Yeah, that's like a third of the women at any given time would say, oh, you don't even understand how tired I am, right? That is how many of us live. And I think I was kind of applying this story to this feeling of this empty jar. The wine is out, the provision is out, we feel exhausted, we feel tired, and then God shows up. And he doesn't just fill it a little bit, he does something massive and over the top. And some of you, you feel that way. You, you walked in here this morning and you're like, man, I'm at the end of my rope, I'm at the end of my energy, I am exhausted, I'm tired, I'm weary, and I need God to fill me back up. I need God to do a miracle emotionally and spiritually for me this morning. Philippians 4, 19 to 20 says, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. My God will supply how many of our needs? All. God will supply every single need that you have. He's like, if you're tired, come to me because I can give you strength. If you're feeling beaten down, come to me. I will give you freedom and grace and mercy in your time of need. If you're feeling discouraged, come to me because I wanna breathe life and encouragement into you. Whatever it is you're facing this morning, if you're feeling dried up, God's like, I have so many riches, so many amazing things that I can pour into your life, but you gotta bring your requests to me. You gotta bring them to me. We last week took a group of 12 of us to El Salvador. It was amazing what God did. But I wanted to tell you just one story. There was, um, at one of the schools we went to, there was a lady who was 18 years old at the time. Um, she had given birth to a little baby when she was 15. And even though this child was three years old, it was maybe the size of a one-year-old. It was a little tiny child. And she was holding this child in her arms and the baby was crying and crying. The entire school assembly that we did, this baby cried and cried and cried. And they couldn't console the baby. The mom couldn't console this baby. So when the whole thing ended, they came and they got my daughter Emerson and they said, we believe God is asking you to come and pray with this teenage girl. And so Emmy went over and um, through an interpreter was able to say, you know, we wanna pray for you. And she just starts crying. She said the mom just melted in tears. And she began to explain that this baby was born with deformities. Her ears were kind of folded in. So she was deaf, she couldn't hear anything. And she had multiple kind of external deformities, but also all sorts of stuff going on internally. She said she has literally cried for three years. This baby has not stopped crying for three years. And this mom was just taxed. I mean, she's like, I'm done. I'm spent, I can't. And so they prayed over this baby, prayed over her. And then they invited this mom to come back to the church and it was just a few hours because we were gonna be doing a feeding program. And so when we got to the church, everybody piles into this church, it's packed in there. And um, the church service started and guess what? In walked sweet mama with her baby and with her mama, like grandma was there. And they came in and when they sat down in the chairs at the church, the baby stopped crying. And the baby sat silent through the whole church service. And so the mom was able to hear and engage in this church service. And when service ended, we were handing out the groceries and we were able to give this huge bag of food to this mom. And so she had to set the child down to be able to carry this massive bag of food back home with her. And as she sat the child down, we realized this itty bitty thing could walk actually and hold her mama's hand. And so she sat her down and uh, as they exited the gate of the church, this little baby was skipping and running and dancing as they exited the, the church property, which was just, if you would have seen a few hours before where the baby was and where she, where she was when they left. And they walked two or three houses down. And then Emerson said, I was sitting in the back kind of under a shaded area. And I watched as this mom turned back around and came back to the church property. And when she came in, she was looking and looking and finally said, Emmy said, I ran over and was like, you know, what's going on? And again, through an interpreter, she said, I just wanted to say thank you. 
You don't even know what this felt like to, my, to have my baby not crying for a while, to have you guys care for us, to give us this food. She was completely and utterly restored. And this baby was not crying. This baby was skipping and jumping on her way home with all the food. Amen. It was so powerful. And I don't think we'll stop praying for that mama for a very long time as we process through the amount of just emotional taxing that was on her, uh, emotionally taxing that was. In 1 Peter 5.10, it says this, after you've suffered a little while, God will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. And I don't know who's in here this morning that feels completely exhausted and worn out, or maybe empty, maybe spiritually empty, but I wanna read that verse again for you. After you've suffered a little while, God will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. And I believe he wants to do that for some folks here today. To remind you that what you're doing, the mundane, ordinary tasks of life, they're worth it. Keep being obedient. If you're walking through a difficult time, can I encourage you this morning to bring your requests to Jesus? Literally nothing is a waste of his time. He cares about your requests. He wants you to bring them to him. And then we've gotta trust him and be obedient. Whatever he says to do, we say yes. Today, I just wanna finish with this thought. How cool is it that Jesus saved the best for last? When you look at this story, it's so cool because you look at a God who took and, and he made wine out of water, which was amazing. And he could have made just enough. But instead, the master of the ceremonies, what was his comment? He's like, you literally saved the best for last. And if you're feeling a little bit beaten down, a little worn out this morning, can I encourage you? God's not done working in your life this morning. God has not stopped working. Amen? Amen. He's like... I have amazing things. The best is still to come. Don't lose hope, don't lose heart. I'm still moving, I'm still working. So this morning, I'm gonna ask you guys, we're gonna bow our heads here in just a moment. We're gonna pray. And then I'm gonna ask you, if you're here this morning and you're like, you know what? I have some stuff I need to bring to Jesus. And I'm just gonna ask you to come up here and join me at this altar. And we're gonna sing a song and we're just gonna take a moment and give our requests to Jesus. We're gonna present our requests to Jesus. Mary was bold. She didn't even pause. She was just like, you got a need? Here's Jesus. I wanna say that again this morning. If you have a need, here's Jesus. He is here in this room. He cares about your needs. He wants to refill you this morning, amen? Amen, so would you do this? Let's bow our heads in prayer this morning. Lord, today, we bring you our requests. Lord, we bring to you every single thing that's weighing heavy on our hearts. For those that are here this morning that are struggling, I pray that this morning they would be bold enough to bring their requests to you. Thank you, Jesus, that you cared even about a wedding party. That Jesus, you cared about meeting the needs of humans, ordinary humans, walking through a, a difficult moment in their life. And Lord, I pray that every person in this room would know that you care just as much about them this morning. And Lord, I believe that you are saving the best for last. That God, those who've been walking through a difficult season, that God, it's not over, but the beginning. Lord, we're just at the beginning of what you wanna do. You wanna do something extraordinary in their lives. So this morning, we bring our requests to you. We present them to you in this place. And we thank you in advance for everything you're about ready to do. Wow, what a powerful message. I pray that you feel encouraged and that you feel empowered to be all that God created you to be. Can I just say thank you so much for watching Church Online with us. If you wouldn't mind, hit that subscribe button as well as the like button on this video. And if you wouldn't mind hitting that notification bell so that you get updated as we post more content throughout the week. Also, if you're local to the Kansas City metro area, I would love to personally invite you to join us for one of our services at our Lee Summit or our Warrensburg campus happening every single Sunday. Thank you again for being here. We love you so much and we'll see you on the next one.